It remains my pleasure to introduce Daniel Buters. He's a PhD student at the uh, Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the uh, University of Cambridge under the supervision of Professor Idris Titi. He received his bachelor's degree uh, from the University of uh, Gregorian and, and a master's degree from University of Cambridge. Uh, his research interests lie in analysis of partial differential equations, in particularly in connection with hydrodynamic turbulence theory, uh, geophysical fluid mechanics. In particular, he has worked on uh, mathematical analysis of large uh, scale oceanic dynamics, subgrid scale turbulence modeling, and 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 the study of tur turbulent wall boundary flows. It remains a pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, the floor is all yours, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavan, for the nice introduction, and thank you to Pavan and Aran for the invitation to speak in the seminar. Um, so I will speak about phase transitions in the fractional three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations. With that, I mean changes in solution properties as the exponent on the Laplacian is varying. And uh, this is joint work with John Gibbon from Imperial, who is in the audience. So let me first uh, show you the, the equations. Um, so the fractional navier stokes equations, uh, they constitute a momentum balance and uh, mass conservation law. So we have a velocity field U, which depends on space and time uh, in three dimensions, which the momentum balance constitutes advection, fractional dissipation with a viscosity nu, and the pressure gradient is enforcing the incompressibility constraint where the pressure also depends on space and time and is a scalar. So if we set S equal one, we cover we recover the usual uh, Navier-Stokes equations that most of the audience will know very well. And in the study of turbulence, hydrodynamic turbulence, the zero viscosity limit, so setting S equal one and sending nu to zero has fundamental importance in the onset of turbulence, and in particular in the presence of physical boundaries. However, from the mathematical analytical point of view, all the transitions in solution properties, they occur when nu becomes zero. So there's a fundamental transition between nu non-zero and nu equals zero. Um, so therefore the limit is very singular. And what we decided to do in this work um, is to study instead of sending, fixing s equal one and sending nu to zero, we fix nu in terms of value, not in terms of units, of course, but, and send s to zero from one. So you start from Navier Stokes, you converge to damp Euler. So this becomes a damping term formally when you set S equal to zero. And we are interested in these changes in solution properties if they occur all at a given value of S or there are different values of S. Are there critical values of S is the, the question we are interested in. And such, such changes in properties we call, we refer to as a phase transition, but this is a matter of terminology. So I should uh, say from the outset that when I say Laplace, fractional Laplacian, I will use the spectral characterization, though probably one can establish these results also with, uh, using different characterizations. And all the results are for periodic boundary conditions. So in some cases, probably it is straightforward to extend them to the no-slip case, but in some cases, I believe it, is, it requires quite a lot of work. So all, my, all the results are with, with periodic boundary conditions. So as I think this is, um, a mixed audience, I will first remind you on some of the anal analytical results that have been known for Navier-Stokes before I turn to fractional Navier-Stokes. So let me first briefly remind you of the function spaces I will use. So given a domain omega, we say that the function lies in LP for P less than infinity if F lies in, if the P power, the integral of the P power is bounded. Now, um, if P is infinity, you say that F is an infinity that that means that the essential supremum of the domain omega is bounded. Then once you have the LP spaces, you can introduce the sub F spaces. For example, you define HN of omega by requiring that F is an L2 and all its derivatives up to order N are an L2. And you analogously, you define WNP by requiring that F and all its derivatives up to order N lie in LP or P between one or infinity. And one can then define the fractional sublef spaces by interpolating between them. Um, finally, I introduce I introduce the Hölder spaces, C alpha omega. You say that the function is Hölder continuous with exponent alpha if it if the difference quotient scale this way with exponent alpha between zero and one. If it's above one, you you define it in terms of the derivatives. 
So these are the functions basically that I will use in this talk. So, um, and please interrupt me if anything is unclear or there are any questions. So let me now remind you about some of the results that are known for Navier-Stokes S equal one. So these are the Navier-Stokes equations. So I've just, the, now we have a normal Laplacian, which has the viscous dissipation. And so first let me um, define the different kinds of solutions that there are. So the, the most straightforward notion of solution is a solution that satisfies the PDE pointwise in space and time, or almost everywhere in space and time. So we say that the strong solution solves Navier-Stokes if n is, has the requirement that it lies in L infinity in time, H1 in space, L2 in time, H, uh, H2 in space. And one can show, in fact, that away from the initial time, the solution becomes smooth. So in fact, C infinity and even G A. Um, so this is the first class of solutions, but one can consider weaker objects. So one can define a weak solution of an obvious stokes as follows. One requires it to be an L infinity in time L2 in space, meaning that the kinetic energy is uniformly bounded. And uh, it has to be an L2 in time H1 in space, meaning that the energy dissipation rate has to be bounded. And instead of asking the, the solution to satisfy the equation pointwise, one requires it to satis it be satisfied in integral form, which means that for all small functions, test functions, fine, psi, the equations have to hold in this weak sense. So I have integrated navier Stokes by parts. So this is a weak solution. When you say Le hope solution, you have this requirement, but you have the additional requirement that the energy inequality has to be satisfied. Um, of course, by formal computations, formal computation suggests an energy balance, but there's a lack of regularity at this regularity level to, to, to uh, prove the energy balance. Um, and then, so that is a layer hope solution. And then a distribution of solution only has the requirement that you is an infinity in time, L2 in space. So the energy dissipation rate need not be bounded. And therefore, this term does not make sense. So when you define a distributional solution, you integrate by parts once more. And so you have minus nu, nu dot uh, delta phi. Um, so in, in the 2D Navier-Stokes equations are quite well understood. The, the, it was proven by Legay and Ladezhensky a long time ago that you have uh, global existence and uniqueness of weak uh, and strong solutions. So in 3D, the picture is different, of course, uh, as, as many of you know in the audience know that it was proven by Legay also that you have global existence of legay hope solutions for L2 data satisfying the energy inequality, as I said. So for all T, you have the energy inequality. It's open whether they satisfy equality. And I should say right from the outset that this property transfers to a uh, fraction of Navier Stokes. For any exponent bigger than L, big, S bigger than zero, you have um, Legay Hopf solution. So there exist global solutions. Legay also showed that you have short time existence of strong solutions. So for smooth initial data, say H1, you have um, at least a short time for which smooth solutions exist. And the requirement H1 was weakened. And for example, Fujita Kato, you have H1 half and L3 and PMO minus one. You have a Kochta tile, you have uh, weaker spaces where you have uh, local opposants. Um, then you can consider criteria that are sufficient to control the smooth solution. So we know there's a log on time smooth solution, but what kind of criteria are sufficient to uh, control, keep the smooth solution bound that its lifespan can be continued? So one such class of criteria is the polysaian regularity criteria, which say that if you have control over the LP in time, LQ in space norm with this constraint on the parameters, either a weak solution becomes smooth or a smooth solution can be continued as long as these norms are under control. So except for the endpoint case, L infinity, uh, L3, this was proven by Pordy and Seren, and then Eskariaza, Seyeg, and Sverak, they proved the endpoint case many decades later that, uh, that control over L infinity L3 is sufficient to um, for regularity. One thing that is also known is, is that these that the weak solutions obey partial regularity, suitable weak solutions obey partial regularity, meaning that um, you can bound the size of the potential singular set. This was done by Scheffer and Caffelli, Kohn, and Nienberg, meaning that the one Hausdorff dimension of the singular set is zero. So the singular set cannot be aligned in space time. So then um, it was shown a few years ago by Buckmaster and Vicol that you have non-uniqueness of very weak solutions. Um, 
which are these, dis these distribution solutions that I discussed before. So an infinity in time, L2 in space, but not the energy dissipation rate is not bounded. And they showed that these solutions are non-unique for Nabia stocks. Um, even for, for, for initial data, you have infinitely many of these. And this is using a technique called convex integration, which allows you to construct the weak solutions about which I will say more later. Um, and then two years ago, there was a result by Alberton, Boué, and Colombo, where they proved non-uniqueness of layer hop solutions for Navier Stokes, but with forcing. So they, they, they found the forcing in initial data, data for which you have two layer hop solutions. So what remains open uh, is the uniqueness or non-uniqueness of Lerae Hopf weak solutions without forcing and uh, the global existence of strong solutions. So um, now I move on. So yes, this is one thing I should say. You might ask me now, for those of you who, who do not do the analysis of Navier Stokes, what is the difference between 2D and 3D? And one, one way to see it is that you can look at it in terms of the vorticity, but one way to also see it is the scaling. So uh, Navier Stokes is known to obey a natural scaling symmetry, namely that if U is a solution, then one can define a scaled solution, U lambda, defined as follows, and it is also a solution. So you can sort of zoom in and out of the small scale behavior if you want. And in 2D, it is known that the, the energy is un invariant on this uh, transformation. Um, but in 3D, the energy, the natural a priori estimates are subcritical, meaning that they are insufficient to control the small scale behavior. So they are insufficient to rule out singularity formation. So in this, this observation about the natural energy level at which the a priori estimates lie, um, the, the scaling gap, let's say, the, give, the, the scaling difference between what is the critical level, so the polysame type criteria and the a priori estimates, this led Leon's already in the 1950s to consider the fraction of Navier Stokes equations, which I believe is the first um, works studying the, uh, or analyzing the fraction of Navier Stokes problem. I'm not completely certain, but I think so. So he studied first in 1959 fraction of Navier Stokes with the double Laplacian, uh, for which he proved global well posits. Ten years later, he he uh, improved his result where he showed that uh, if the exponent is at least five over four, you have global well which in, which sort of which agrees with the scaling, as I will show you later. Then several decades later, Terence Tao improved this result up to a logarithm, but there's a, a slightly logarithmic difference with scaling gap, then you still can have global well poisons as he proved in 2009. So this is on the one end where you have the well poisons results. On the other hand, if the value of S is low, now you can, you can show more results. So it was shown using this complex integration technique that I will discuss in more detail later, by first Colombo, De Lelis, and De Rosa, De Rosa up to one over five, and then De Rosa up to uh, one over three, that you have non-uniqueness of the hop solutions without forcing. So they show, in fact, that for many initial data, there are infinitely many Le hop solutions. So it's quite wild, not uniqueness. Um, so uh, above five over four, we have uniqueness of Le hop solutions. Below one, one third, we have non-uniqueness. In terms of the distribution of solutions constructed by uh, Buckmaster and Vico, you, it was shown by Lo and Titi that the technique can be pushed up to the Leon's exponent. So these are solutions with just bounded kinetic energy. Um, so this confirms the Leon's scaling in some sense. And this was also done um, in 2D up to S less than one, uh, where one is not a critical parameter in 2D. Um, this result of Alberton and Boe and Colombo that I discussed can also be pushed up to five of four, uh, as was done in this work here, where they pick a forcing and they show that below five of four, you can have non-uniqueness of the ray hop solution with forcing. Again, without forcing, we know only up to one third for now. Um, and this was done also by Everton and Colombo in 2D up to uh, one, which is again, confirms the scaling. As far as partial regularity is concerned, um, it was shown in a sequence of works that uh, the house, the five minus four S Hausdorff dimension, uh, the singular set is zero. So this again is in line with the Leon scaling that at, if you push it to S, you send S to five of five over four, you find that the Hausdorff, any finite 
positive house of dimension zero. Um, so the, this type of results where you study a given PD and vary its exponent on the Laplacian on the dissipation, this has been done also, I should mention, for the fraction of Burke's equations, Burke's equation, where there the critical value for well posed, and this is one half. Um, so there exist many works. This is one example by Kiselev, Nazarov, and Sternberg. Um, there also exist such results for the surface quasi equation, but I will not discuss this in detail. Um, so now let me show you the first of the three results that we have. So we have three results. Um, we have a blow-up criterion or a continuation criterion. Um, we have a local energy balance up to a defect term, and we have um, higher order derivative estimates. So let me show you the first one. So we have, we have restricted the case as bigger than one over three. And um, we show that in this regime of S, and if you have a smooth solution, then if this integral, this quantity remains under control, then the solution can be continued past the time t. So it means that the way you should think about this is I have, an, I have control of a special derivative up to order S with some power, uh, temporal weighting or temporal power, which is approaching infinity as I send S to one third. If this quantity is bounded, then the solution remains. As I said, this can also be regarded as a blow up criterion that if there is blow up, um, then this has to, as T approaches the blow up time, this has to go to infinity and vice versa. So it has to be infinitely. And um, this proof relies on a sequence of, of energy estimates that you can do for the HN norms. What has been known for a long time is that if for Euler and Navier-Stokes, the control of the gradient at infinity is sufficient for global regularity. But what we what, what is different here is that we can make use of the viscous dissipation and using uh, an inequality, inequality that we prove, we lower the infinity norm to a derivative order S. And part of these norms can be absorbed into the viscous dissipation. Um, so this is clearly a viscous result. This is in line with, with the Podicyan uh, criteria that I uh, discussed before. That this is not true, obviously, for Euler. But for Euler, you would need s equal s equal one for this to be true. Um, so, and moreover, this requirement, as we we know that this requirement is sharp because of these results. So let me explain. So, um, these papers have shown that. You have non uniqueness of weak solutions in L infinity in time CS in space. So um, let me first say a bit about what the technique what they use, which is called convex integration. So convex integration is an iterative scheme that allows you to produce weak solutions, distribution of solutions to fluid equations. So it has its origins in differential geometry, but in the case of fluid mechanics, it was developed by Bellelis and Sikli to prove the existence and non uniqueness of weak solutions for Euler as the a priori estimates are insufficient to produce this solution. So let me explain. So unlike Navier-Stokes, for Euler, you have a priori control in an infinity in time up to in space, which is only gives you weak star convergence in that space, and it is insufficient uh, to pass to the limit in the nonlinear term. So therefore, there exists, prior to these results, there existed weaker work, uh, types of weak solution, such as the distribution, of, sorry, the measure valued solutions of Dipena Maida, the dissipative solutions of Lyons, but it was unclear whether there are distribution solutions for Euler. And using this technique, you can you can establish that um, for all initial data, actually. And so after the works of Deleuze and Siklihidi, there were works together with several other people, Bachmann, Stefiko, Iset, where they attacked the Onzaga conjecture, which is proving the um, second part, which is you can show that there exists uh, dissipative solutions below a certain regularity threshold, but I will not dwell on that now. But what this 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 technique does is it you start with an approximate solution up to some error, some sort of forcing, a Reynolds stress, let's say. And then at every iteration, one adds a perturbation to decrease the size of the Reynolds stress um, of the, the error term. And the difficult part is then that you have to manage several constraints at the same time. One wants to have, uh, one wants to get closer to a solution, so the error has to decrease in size in a given norm. One has to maintain uniform regularity bounds for given type, and one often wants to ensure other properties, such as adherence to an energy profile, 
smallness of the singular set and so on. So this is often, there are often competing demands. So, so uh, let me show you one result, which is in detail, which is known for Navier-Stokes, which we can, fractional Navier-Stokes, which we can show to be sharp using our criterion. So the result by Bullock, Quinn, and Palazek is the following. So they assume S less than one third. And suppose I have two small solutions of fraction of Navier Stokes on some time interval, zero to T. Then they, using convex integration, they can construct a weak solution in N infinitine times C S in space, so therefore in the Le Hopf regularity class, um, such that it agrees with the first solution on a small initial time interval, and it agrees with the second solution on a small later time interval. So it means, uh, among other things that uh, this gives you wild non-uniqueness because you can think about this as a gluing result. You can glue the choice of U1 and U2 is arbitrary. So you can really, you can glue anything together. So it's for given initial data, you can have smooth initial data, you can have infinitely many weak solutions. So this is one cor corollary of this result. And, but this had been known uh, by the work of Colombo, de Lelis, de Rosa, and de Rosa, and so on. Um, but what they do is they are able to really have coin, uh, make the weak solution coincide um, with a smooth solution for an initial time interval. And using the continuation criterion, you can see that this result is sharp with respect to the value of S, so let me explain. So I can, I pick a smooth solution here, and I know that the N-infinity CS norm is bounded uniformly. So if this result would be true for S larger than one third, the smooth solution would have uniform control of this quantity, which is weaker than L infinity CS. So it would mean that we could that the solution would stay smooth and can be continued, continued all the way up to the final time capital T. So this would give you a contradiction because you cannot pick a second solution you two. It's it's constrained. So therefore, uh, this result is sharp with respect to the value of S. And also our result as a consequence is also sharp with respect to the value of S. You cannot hope to have it for lower value of S. As is, you can already see by the scaling. I will I will show you that later. So anyway, but this is the point that this this result is optimal um, with respect to the value of S. So this is the first of the results. So let me now turn to the second one. So now we go to a higher regime. So now we assume that S is bigger than or equal to three over four. So assume we have a Le hop solution. We can show that uh, it's it's uh, obeys a local energy balance up to a defect term. So you can write it in the following way. So for all test functions psi, it satisfies the following uh, uh, weak, let's say, energy balance. And um, this defect term can be written as follows. So for a given modifier, you can take a given modifier and you compute this quantity with the increments in, in psi. And you take the limit, and then this gives you an object which converts in a weak, in a negative sublevel space, and you can show that the limit as epsilon goes to zero is independent of the initial choice of modifier. Um, so this, this sort of this term, if you want, it captures the potential non-vanishing and almost dissipation, or the potential irregularity of the solution. And um, the reason we have this constraint three over four is that we need you to be in L3 in time and space, and because otherwise you cannot have a well-defined energy type inequality. Um, and this is ensured by the Le Ray Hopf regularity only when it is bigger than, S is bigger than or equal to three over four. So this result was established for Navier-Stokes in the case S equal one, and um, also for L3, L3 weak solutions of Euler in, in the connection, in connection with the Onsoyer conjecture. Um, so the proof of this result relies on taking a, a test function u epsilon psi. So u, u epsilon is the modified version of u because you cannot, u is only a Le hop solution. So you cannot, uh, the derivatives cannot are not smooth. You cannot uh, uh, just insert them there. And um, then you take the limit epsilon to zero. And the term that prevents you from establishing the energy balance is the nonlinear term because the modification of the product is not the same as the product of the modifications. And then this gives you a commutator and uh, you can capture this commutator with this defect term, which, I'm, which I wrote down here, which you can see here. So that um, 
these terms they vanish because of, due to the incompressibility, but these terms they capture the difference between the modification, the product and the products the modifications. So, so that was the second result. So let me now turn to the last result. Um, so for we now restrict to the case as bigger than five over six. And this result has to do with intervals of regularity and that um, the higher order derivatives of Le hopf solutions can uh, be in weighted or in, in high regularity spaces at the price of low time capability. So let me explain. Um, first, we have the following preliminary lemma. So define the set of regular times for a given Le hopf solution as follows. So I say that T is a regular time if the HN norm for a given natural number N is continuous for a small time interval around this, this time T. Um, and on the other hand, the set of singular times is defined um, by requiring that at that time, the solution um, uh, is not U of T is not an H1. Or H1 is already enough for regularity at this, when S is bigger than five over six, but you can do it for up to N. Um, we, of course, do not know whether the singular set is, is non-empty, but one can bound its size. And um, we show the following. So for S bigger than 5 over 6, and let U be a Le Hopf solution, the complement of the set of regular times around which there is such an interval, that the complement of that set has zero Lebesgue measure. So it means, among other things, that Le Hopf solutions for S bigger than 5 over 6 are regular almost everywhere in time. And um, this result was established for the case in the case S equal one uh, by Foyash, Guillaume, and Tama. And such estimates on the dimension of the set of singular times in the Navier Stokes case have been known before by Lere and uh, Scheffer, for example. And um, one of the main points of this result is that it emphasizes the role of five over six. So, as I said before, there exist partial regularity results. Um, for S bigger than three over four, but they constrain the dimension, the, sp the space-time dimension of the singular set. While here you know that above five over six, if there is a singular set, it has to be constrained to time slices, measures zero set of time slices. While it has not been ruled out, as far as I'm aware, that between three over four and five over six, it could be that you have a singular point in space um, at every point in time. You just know that the size of that singular set in terms of space time house, that dimension cannot be too big. But you could have a singular point at every point in time. It has not been ruled out. But now we know between at least five over six onwards, you know that this scenario has been ruled out. So that the singular set is confined to time slices. Um, so the, the proof of this result relies on the sequence of energy estimates for the HMS norms. So you work inductively. You know that um, by the energy inequality that because you are an L2 HS, that um, uh, the HS norm is finite for, om for almost every time, for it, it cannot be infinite for more than a zero measure, set, measure zero set. Then you derive an energy estimate for the HS norm, which gives you control over the H2S norm. And again, you can, co you can conclude that the set of singular times has measure zero. And then you proceed inductively. And the main difference between here and Foyash, Giyope, and Tamam is that now they can do, they 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 work with um, integer number of derivatives, so you can use calculus of the qualities. But here now the fractional Laplacians are non-local objects, so you, you have to use little bit Paley theory and pair differential calculus and commutator estimates to make it work, but the philosophy is the same. So as I said, the way hop solutions are regular almost everywhere in time, and for S bigger than five or six, and you can quantify this in the following way. So what we show is that for the Ray Hopf solution belongs to the following spaces for all n natural numbers n. And I stress that this is unconditional. Um, so take an arbitrary number of derivatives, there's 10, 15, 1,000, a million. We show that there is a very small time integrability exponent such that U belongs to that space. So the very high derivative norms, they are bounded, but at the, at the price of a very low time integrability power exponent. Um, so in the case of Nagia Stokes, there have been works along these lines. So if, first, I should mention the work of Tata, who showed that U is an L1 at infinity. 
which is important later to study the Lagrangian properties of novice stocks. Um, and this result in the case of uh, Navier stocks was um, the special case, let's say, uh, S equal one was established by Foyer, Kiyope, and Tamar um, in the periodic setting. And then Duff extended this to the case of no slip boundary conditions and with forcing. And he also has the following extension of the result that this allows the result of Foyer, Kiyope, and Tamar, and also this result allows for an arbitrary number of space derivatives but he also allows it for an arbitrary number of uh, time derivatives. Then um, such a result was established in the Gevray space by Che um, a few years later. And um, there have been results along uh, for the second derivative in low end spaces um, by Constantin, Leon, Choi, Vasseur, and then Vasseur Yang. Um, so let me make a few more remarks on what you on these on this result. So as I this is already said that now um, this result emphasizes the role of the exponent S5 over 6, that there's different behavior or different constraints on the behavior between 3 over 4, 5 over 6, and 5 over 6 onwards, that um, between 3 over 4 and 5 over 6, you have space-time space partial regularity results, but um, above 5 over 6, you also have the temporal partial regularity results. And these, these results by Foyer, Giope, and Tamam, they have been applied in several ways in the case of Navier Stokes. So um, it was, John has written several papers on the associated length scales with these uh, with these bonds. And recently, uh, Young studied these bonds of this type on sets of fractal dimension. So she considers, uh, I think it's Lipschitz, uh, sets of Lipschitz regularity with dimension between zero and three, but it can be fract fractional. And she proves that on such sets, Legay Hopf solutions also have process, process regularity. Um, but it can be seen as somehow a constraint on the intermittency. Intermittency in turbulence often means that you, um, there can be very sparse, that the regions where the derivative of the velocity of the vorticity is very large, sparse sets, but such a result as the result by Young provides a constraint in the intermittent season. And um, these regularity results for Navier Stokes have also been used for the Lagrangian representation of the Navier Stokes equation. So they, the Voyage Guillaume and Tamam in a later paper showed using these results that you can have, they prove the existence of a measurable flow map for and Lagrangian trajectories for uh, Legay Hope solutions. And this was extended by Robinson and Sadowski, where they showed. For suitable weak solution that you have almost everywhere uniqueness of, of the corruption trajectories. So now let me make a few remarks on how we prove this result. Um, so by the lemma, one knows that uh, there exists a countable number of regularity intervals um, which have full measure. Um, so um, one can work interval by interval and then sum over them. On doing the estimates. And on the interval, the solution is smooth, so all this, the formal man manipulations are allowed. Um, so the trick goes as follows. So as I said, one works inductively and one finds estimates for the HMS norm. And one makes the following observation. When, when one finds op uh, estimates of this type, again, as I said, using these paradifferential calculus type estimates and the commutative estimate, one makes the following observation that the time integral of this quantity, the HS norm squared, is bounded due to the energy inequality. So if one would divide by this, and one deals somehow with the time derivative, one can find an estimate on this weighted new HM plus one S norm divided by the HM S norm at some point. So this is what we do. So one has to deal with the time derivative. So we divide. This is what you get. And so we take the time, the regularity interval up to a set of order, a small set of, of size epsilon, and then we take the limit later. So on the regularity interval, we can compute everything explicitly. And this is what you get. Now, this term, recall that this is positive. So this term is on the left-hand side of the inequality, so we can just throw it away. And this term goes to the right-hand side of the inequality. But recall that we have blow up on the end of the the regularity interval. So if we send epsilon to zero, this term is going to infinity, and then this term is going to zero. 
this norm is going to infinity, this term is going to zero. So I can, I can now, as I said, I divide it here, I integrate, and then I send epsilon to zero and I obtain this estimate here. And as I said, this is bounded by the energy we got. So now I can just sum over the time intervals and I obtain a bound on this weighted quantity for every m. Um, so how do I then use it to bond of, to get control over the high derivative norms? Again, one proceeds inductively. One says, so one knows that the square of the HS norm in, in integrated in time is bounded. So this is the, the, ba in the base case. And assume one that the HMS norm to the power two gamma M, its time integral is bounded. So now I can find the higher order norm. So I write it as follows. I, I, I multiply and divide by uh, this quantity. And then I use Hölder to recover, to rewrite this as that here, which I know to be bounded. So when I do that, I find some power on the HMS norm, which I've, to use the inductive hypothesis, it has to be equal to gamma M. And when you do that and you do some computations, you find that gamma M has to have this form. Um, so then after applying several interpolation inequalities, one finds the, the following result that U lies in the space here. So recall, so observe that um, I said n, uh, I said s equal to, uh, I said s equal to one. So then I obtain one over two n minus one, which is the Foyashki Ube Tamam uh, result, which for example, gives you control over L2 thirds in time, H2 in space. Okay. So what I've been telling you now, I've been three results and they emphasize the role of these three exponents, one third, three over four, five over six. Um, the role, the five or four has been known since the classical work of Leon's. And I will tell you now how you can recover these exponents, why these exponents are to be expected, and which suggests at least that these the results with respect to the value of S, it's not an artifact of the approach, it's really a, something, a property of the equation, rather. So as I said, Navier-Stokes has a scaling symmetry. Um, and similarly, um, fractional Navier-Stokes has a scaling symmetry, namely that... Um, if u is a solution, I, I can define u lambda to be this way, and then it is also a solution. So again, it leads to these sub and supercritical spaces and the critical spaces, which determine whether the, the nonlinear term can be seen as a perturbation with respect to the fraction of dissipation. So when you do the computations, you find the following. You find that in 3D, n infinity in time, h5 over 2 minus 2s is, is a critical space, and similarly, n infinity in time, c1 minus 2s is a critical space in 3D. So now let me show you where the exponents come from one by one. So um, for S equal three, what we in effect are trying to do is to see at what, until what point can one control the solution by a derivative of order S, which is on the same order as the regular, the Legay-Hopf regularity. So it means that suppose the Legay-Hopf regularity would be uniform in space and time, would it be enough to get a solution? So once you rule out intermittency somehow, you, you assume that all the LP norms scale the same way in, 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 in both time and space. So this, this one, then one has to match L infinity CS with the critical space, which is L infinity C1 minus 2S. So one, one, one equates CS with 1 minus 2S, one finds that S is one third is the limiting number. Below that, one cannot hold with the existing a priori estimates to, to extend it. So this explains where the one third is coming from. Um, the three fours, as I said, this already said that if from three fours on and higher, you can, the Le Hopf regularity gives you um, that U lies in L3, L3, which is the minimal regularity to have well-defined energy inequality. Because there's a u squared u there in the, and I should say that the, the theorem that I showed you it goes through for s less than three four, but then you need the L three L three regularity as a separate assumption. Um, now about five over six, the 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 result of Foyer's Giobentamam in Navier Navier Stokes somehow leverages on the fact 
that a critical norm is under control most of the time. If you are in L2, H1, it means that the H1 norm is bounded for almost every time. But they show that the set of singular times is measure zero. Um, so if you look at this for fractional Navier Stokes, what you are asking, in fact, is that if I would replace the L2 HS norm with an L infinity HS norm, at what point is that sufficient for regularity? So um, you you have that U in L infinity HS has to coincide with U, uh, L infinity H5 over 2 minus 2S. You match the two and it gives you S is 5 over 6. So as I said, it is a way to see that for from 5 over 6 on, the critical norm is under control almost everywhere in time. So um, this I should have I should stress is that one can see from the result is that if there is a singularity above five or six, the solution will become regular again. After. While in three, four, between three over four and five over six, I don't think anybody has showed this is open that um, it is it has not been ruled out that if you have a singularity, the, the, the solution remains a weak solution. Of course, you have constraints on the size of the potential singular set, but it's not. It's, it's it, it has not been ruled out that you. It has not. It is not ensured. Let's say that the solution would become smooth for a small time interval after a singularity. Yeah. So the exponent um, S is five or four from Leon's, which was which is classical, as I say. This can be seen quite uh, straightforwardly that the a priori estimates give me control of L infinity in time up to in space. When does that coincide with, with this here? Well, when s equals 5 over 4, then 5 over 2 minus 2 s equals 1, it equals 0. So, so this recovers the Leon scaling, but this is, as I said, this has been known very long for a very long time. So now let me uh, conclude. So, um, as I said, um, the point of this work was really to study whether there are critical exponents uh, for. Uh, the fractional Navier Stokes equations outside five over four. And as part of this work, we find three of them one, one over three, three over four, and five over six. So for one over three, we show that there's this, this Polysian type criterion where if, if the, this, this quantity is bounded, you can continue the solution. If, if there's a blow up, this quantity also has to blow up. Um, so it, and it, therefore, it, it can be used also in numerical simulation to judge whether there, there could be a blow up. Um, and we use this to show the sharpness of the complex integration constructions of uh, which show the non-uniqueness of weak solutions for fraction of Navier Stokes with S less than one third. So for the free fourth, I showed you this energy balance, which uh, holds above three over four with this defect term capturing the potential irregularity. And five over six, we have the um, uh, we have these this constraint that the, the singular time, set of singular times has to be measure zero and that you have these higher order derivative estimates, which provides further constraints on uh, this the singular set. So as I said, so all these, these parameters can be recovered from the natural scaling of the equations. And it raises the possibility at least that if you look at fractional Navier Stokes in with intervals of S between the critical exponents, that these, the, the, the solutions share properties. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for the nice talk. I request the members of the audience to kindly raise your hand for questions, and I'll call out your name uh, as they appear on my screen. Okay, I do not really see any uh, any any raised question, uh, any raised hand. So, so I trust that then no questions. Uh, is there any final remark or feedback anybody wants to uh, share? You can unmute your mic. Okay, I, I believe there are none. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Daniel, for the uh, nice talk. Uh, it, it was it was a, it was really a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs>